We're very excited to be in conversation with two towering giants from the field of artificial intelligence education right here at Davos, uh, Dr. Andrew Ng as well as Jeff Majin Kalda from Coursera. Thank you very much for joining us on Money Control. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to go first with you. AI is one of the key themes this time at Davos. Um, what do you, you know, what is your pitch going to be as far as AI is concerned in terms of usage, regulation, responsible AI? There's so many uses of AI. We still have a lot of work collectively in front of us to identify and build all the wonderful things that can be used for. I do see across many governments around the world that there's a risk of overregulation. Um, there's a lot of hype and fear about AI. And while I would love to have good regulation, to think about what are the risks of applications and regulate against risky applications. I'm also seeing a lot of regulation that I think runs the risk of siphoning the technology and this would be to the detriment of everyone. Right. Um, Jeff, do you also believe that, you know, there is a case for There's models to emerge in edtech using generative AI, newer business models, perhaps newer startups that are going to come up? I certainly think that generative AI is going to transform ed tech. I mean, we at Coursera have been embracing it for a number of things. We we were just in uh, Delhi last week announcing that uh, 4,000 courses have been translated into Hindi. So we're doing course translations. We have Coach, which is a personalized assistant that can help students on the course material in any language that they speak. We have Course Builder, which allows us to help build courses. So generative AI will have a huge impact, not only on jobs and the skills people need, but also on the way that we teach and the way that we learn. With respect to startups, I think there's gonna be a lot of innovation, but many of these startups, I think are just gonna be building features. It'll be difficult to build businesses unless you're building foundation models. Uh, I think EdTech is gonna really favor some of the bigger players. Right. Um, Andrew, you know, one thing that stood out for me in the WEF Economist Outlook this morning is that while generative AI will drive up innovation and productivity, um, rich nations or high income countries are perhaps poised to benefit more. So do you think, you know, there will be a divergence here in what kind of countries benefit from AI? In the short term, it is true that um, I think wealthier nations have been faster to embrace generative AI. In fact, I think the more digital economies and the more digital countries tend to jump on these trends faster. But I think on the flip side, in a somewhat longer term, it could be a very democratizing force as we take intelligence, this is artificial intelligence rather than just human intelligence, and make that available to everyone very cheaply. Intelligence is a power to use skills and knowledge to make good decisions, and AI lets us do that much cheaper than ever before, and we can now make this available to a lot more people. Another thing is uh, BCG just came out with a report on January 11th of executives. They found that 89% of executives said that generative AI was one of their top three priorities, but 90% were dissatisfied with the rate of progress. The number one reason was upskilling, not enough upskilling happening to take advantage of this technology. They actually found that three regions are falling behind in upskilling. That's Europe, uh, Latin America, and Africa. On the other hand, Asia Pacific and North America are skilling faster. And as Andrew says, it's going to be largely a race to skill people in order to harness the power of generative AI in a responsible way. Right. Um, Andrew, you know, with respect to responsible AI, um, OpenAI recently changed its policy. I think they removed a specific section that prevented it from aiding military. So do you believe LLMs are co close to being used for defense purposes? And how can that be prevented? You know... I think none of us um, want to ever see AI used to wage an unjust war. And with um, what's happened with uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine, I feel like there are unfortunate things already being done with even older generations of AI technologies. Um, I like the fact that I live in democracy and part of me, I'm grateful to the people standing up to protect democratic nations and to a uh, center for values that hopefully can make everyone on the planet better off. No one wants war. And um, I feel like there is a uh, important need to protect certain values. Uh, and then and, and unfortunately, sometimes it takes a military to do that. Right. Um, Andrew, there's also a debate in India on whether we should work hard to build local LLMs or just build use cases on open source LLMs. What do you think? I would say it's worth doing both. Um, 
One of the things that the global OEMs often train the big tech companies often don't understand regional content. So if you ask questions about the U.S. government, in fact, the United States is more likely to get that right. If you ask questions about different regions in different countries, including India, it may be less likely to get that right. So I think there is one case to be made for building regional or per nation or per region OEMs. Um, having said that, open source OEMs are also making tremendous progress in a great way to build new applications on top. So I think we are different applications and lots of different options. Just like today, I wouldn't use a single computer for everything. There's something in the data center, my laptop, even your smartwatch, I think in the future, we'll use different OLs for different applications. Right. Um, I'm going to ask both of you, you know, two or three skills that engineers should have to future-proof their jobs. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying, um, historically before generative AI, what we focused on is how the technology worked and how to upskill the builders. That's still going to be very important. But with generative AI, it's a tool that everybody can use. So it's not only how it works, it's how it's used. And almost everyone's going to be using generative AI, and they need to be trained on how to use it. So I think a lot of the skills for the builders, well, Andrew can speak more to that. But in terms of the users, a lot of it's going to be about creativity. It's going to be about understanding responsibility and risk management. It's going to be a lot about curiosity and lifelong learning. So I I really think that the users of this technology are far broader than the builders and broad scale training is going to be required. Yeah, I agree, Jeff. Um, I use GPT-4 and BARD and the local OM running on my laptop, you know, some mix of them every day. And I think it makes me more productive. I think Jeff as well. Um, pretty much every knowledge worker, maybe even beyond knowledge work, but I think every knowledge worker should, I would encourage to learn about generative AI because you can already use it in the day to day to be more productive. And then to speak up builders specifically, um, it's an amazing tool to build on top of using generative AI by calling APIs, uh, either with locally hosted LMs or ones hosted by the large tech companies. It is now possible to build AI systems in minutes, maybe hours that used to take me and very good AI teams months to build. What this means is I think every software engineer and definitely every machine learning engineer, I would encourage them to learn these tools because it lets you do much more than was possible before in a much shorter time. Right. And what's your sense on India? It's one of the biggest consumers of Coursera. But what do you see India's role in terms of AI itself? Because right now, Silicon Valley seems to have the edge. Every time there's a major tech disruption, like we just saw with generative AI, I think it gives every nation a shot at um, playing an even bigger role than it has before. India has always had a very strong uh, tech, IT, software ecosystem. And with that strong base, I think that India is actually in a very good position to quickly embrace the new skills that Jeff was talking about, certainly in tech, but also more broadly, and then to play a, play a huge role in the Gen AI world. We were just with uh, the head of HR from l &T, you know, the ones who built the Delhi airport, and they're rolling out Coursera's Generative AI Academy. We started with really Andrew's course and a whole pillar called Generative AI for Everyone, and that's basic fluency for everybody. Just a couple of weeks ago, we launched Generative AI for Executives. I have a course called Navigating Generative AI for CEOs and Leaders. This kind of skilling is really, really important. And when we look at India and we look at the first company to do a global rollout of the Generative AI Academy, it was L&T in India. Right. Um, if you were both 25 years old today, what would you start up? I am so really excited about the power of education and training to empower others to do much better work. So I'm still uh, thrilled that, that, at having an opportunity to work on that. And also, while um, a lot of the media excitement has been the tech layer, I think there's a, even more work to be done at the application layer. So I think there are so many things there that um, uh, my team at AI Fund if, if I weren't leading AI funds uh, I, and, and, and also doing work in education through Coursera and AI, um, I, I, and, and, and then building applications like landing, I would want to do probably those things right now. Yeah, I, I would say finding proprietary data that's highly valuable only because of the unlock of generative AI, where the company maybe doesn't even know that the data are so valuable, and then building specific applications using that particular data to create... Uh, value, not overall globally, but in a certain domain. I think there are going to be certain domain-specific applications using domain-specific data that will unlock a lot of value and a company could have good competitive advantage. Don't try to build the next large language model for the world 
try to build some domain specific uh, large language models and other kinds of AI applications. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I think Jeff has it right. I think that um, there will be some huge winners building large language models, maybe some regional winners as well, but that space is hyper competitive. Uh, and, and there are so many more opportunities in applications, applying AI to healthcare, financial services, uh, you know, the, I don't know, the, the IT consulting, lots of different sectors. And I see a lot of those sectors as much less competitive. So there's a TFI you're looking for startup idea, finding those domains to build in, I think has huge opportunities that very relatively few people are working on right now. Right, I'm gonna ask you final couple of questions. How does one complete a course on Coursera? Uh, I think that if someone has not yet done a course on Coursera, uh, well worth browsing the huge course catalog and finding what you find enjoyable. I find that one thing that helps a lot for completing courses is to make a habit of learning. Um, you know, should I stop? Uh, no, no, no. Can, can that go up there? No, that's fine. You can continue. Sure, yes. Yeah. You know, sometimes people try to cram everything into one weekend. Um, and that's fine. Learning a lot in one weekend is a great thing to do, but I find that learning is a lifelong thing. Um, and if someone can cultivate a habit of spending a little bit of time every week learning, then, you know, in, a, in, in one week, maybe you learn only a little bit, but in a year or two years, you can really transform your life. And um, in fact, a lot of Coursera's gateway certificates show that if you learn a little bit, it may be six months, you know, something. You could often uh, uh, be well qualified for a new job or a new career and really do something you couldn't before. I agree. And as Andrew said, focusing on things that matter to you, like your career, are as a big incentive for people to do it. So a study of learning in a topic that is important to you and that's mm -hmm. going to move your life forward, that's usually what gives people the motivation to power through. Right. Final question. What are both of you learning right now on Coursera? Uh, <laughs> Andrew, don't tell me only teach. <laughs> you know, the most recent thing I completed was uh, uh, I was learning stream lake coding. And there was, a, there was a, actually a Coursera guided project that I really enjoyed for that. And I'm just finishing Andrew's course on AI for everyone. <laughs> and I just built my course. So I've already taken that one. There's another great course from Imperial College of London called um, Creative Thinking Strategies in a World of AI. So how does the human continue to do something special, different, and value added, which has a lot to do with creativity with others. And there's specific strategic tools on how to be creative and add value through creativity. And that's from one of the best universities and the best professors in the world. Right. On that note, thank you both very much for this very special interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.